Amen. Well, it is good to see everybody here tonight. Uh, what we're going to do or attempt to do as long as the Holy Ghost allows us to do it is to try to do a systematic teaching on the tabernacle. Uh, we've heard so much, so many remarks and even requests to teach about it. And um, so we're, we've had enough people asking uh, that we can uh, just kind of touch on that and kind of do the basics of it at least without all of the revelation in layers that we use, even though that's very hard for me to do because of experience. And now when I look at scriptures, you can see literally the tabernacle is all in the Bible, you know, in so many verses of scripture. And uh, we want to be able to, uh, to, to uh, be able to uh, look at that and deal with it. And so it's good to see everybody here tonight. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and one, one wonderful thing that happened this week is as I was uh, sitting down, Cynthia and I were watching a movie that we rented uh, because it was supposedly that this individual had an encounter uh, with God. And uh, it was very good. And one of the actors was acting as the late, great Dr. Billy Graham. And uh, it stirred me to tears as I watched the actor act out Billy Graham's part as a revivalist and an evangelist. And uh, I was blessed and the spirit of God just really spoke to me right there saying, you see, look at the work of the evangelist during your lifetime. And certainly we had a few of them that were powerful. I don't know if y'all remember R.W. Schambach. Uh, I used to listen to 15 Minutes of Power, man, with R.W. Schambach on KJN. And it's amazing how much that man could get done in 15 minutes. I couldn't believe that this man was could do that much work. But nonetheless, uh, what we want to do is we want to, the, the reason I brought that up is because as we start with the tabernacle, we'll do a little overview and I'll mention it again, but the gate and the outer court is the area in the, the place where the evangelist does his work, her work. That's where they do their work. And it's so, so clear because of their message, but there's also a, uh, an instruction and an admonishment for us to also do the work of the evangelist and that's speaking to the entire fivefold ministry team. Okay, and so we wanna talk about that just a little bit tonight. Again, I'm excited. I thank the Lord for his presence. I thank the Lord Jesus for being here for the presence of the Holy Spirit tonight. And tonight we're just gonna be really easy going, amen, and, uh, and try to teach on this. So I'm gonna share my screen and get started with this and what i love about this is that we can we're recording this and that uh we can always go back and take a look at it and whatnot and i thank the lord for that okay and so bang and share amen and here and let's see all right well that's how i gotta do it that's how i gotta do it okay so the tabernacle here um amen uh, we have uh, the first passage of scripture that has always uh, stirred us. It's actually going to be in Hebrews, but this is where it all begins, where uh, it's saying, build according to the pattern shown to you in the mount. And that's Exodus 25 and 40. Uh, in Exodus 25, 8 and 9, it says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Why? that I may dwell among them according to all that I shew thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it, amen. And so the purpose again is, and let them make me a sanctuary, why? That I may dwell among them, that's key. And so again, accuracy is important in the way that we're going to build this so that God might be able to dwell with us. 
Here's a little overview picture of the tabernacle, which deals with Exodus 35 to 40. And as you can see all the way to your right, there's the entrance gate. And you can see even the compass, north, south, east, and west, that the entrance was pointing towards the east. And if you study uh, what Solomon prayed, saying, when your people look towards the east and pray towards this building, towards this sanctuary, hear them, Lord. And so it's at the east gate. And as you're going to see, there are six pieces of furniture, two in the outer court, uh, three in the uh, holy place, and uh, one in the most holy place or the holy of holies. And so you'll see in the outer court two, the altar of burnt offerings. And then you also see the bronze laver, those two items, okay? So when you come into the gate, as you can see by the E, the, the, the entrance gate, the first thing that an individual will see is the altar of burnt offerings. Then when you enter into another veil, and as you can see my cursor right here, this is a veil, you will see then to your left, the golden candlesticks or the lampstand. Then you'll see the table of showbread, and then you'll see the altar of incense. All of these are overlaid with gold. These items are overlaid with bronze or brass. Then in the final place, the holy of holies or the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant. All of these have tremendous meaning to them. And we're gonna just scan. We may dig a little bit in some of them, but it's important that, that we understand uh, the basics of what this thing looks like. Here's just another overview picture of it that we have where you can see mainly the outer court and then the tabernacle or the sanctuary. Uh, it shows here that people were allowed in the outer courtyard, but the tabernacle is only for the priest. Then you see a breakdown on the inside of the tabernacle, the most holy place or holy of holies, only the high priest could go into that area. And in the holy place, only the priest, the sons of Aaron, the Levites, could enter into this particular area. Can y'all see all of that? Okay, good. And then here's yet another wonderful overview of the tabernacle and you know you can a bird's eye view showing you what it looks like and of course we definitely want to talk tonight about this gate just for a few minutes the lessons are going to be short and sweet but here it is here's that gate okay and then of course you'll see the uh the bronze altar okay and then you'll also see uh that's the sacrificial altar then you'll see the brazen laver where they did their washings. Then you can see five columns, one, two, three, four, five, that are holding in a support for the door and the curtain that allows you access into the sanctuary, okay? And you can see how, you know, this cur the curtains are all around this particular item so that people can't just see clearly into what's happening. You could only come in one way, and that's through the gate. Only one way. Outer court, natural atmosphere. But when you come into this atmosphere, the different light is going to be the candlesticks, and there's going to be a different scent because of what's coming off of this altar and fresh bread that's going to be in there. There's a scent there as well as opposed to the animal sacrifices, animals dying and being sacrificed on this particular altar, animals dying, okay, sacrifices. And that happened every day, ladies and gentlemen, to show you the tedious work of the priesthood and what was required for the penalty of sin, that daily they would have this operation was being performed. That just overwhelms me to think about that, okay? Next, here's another shot of the articles of furniture. Again, the brazen labor right here. 
then the the brazen altar, then the uh, the incense altar, then the table of showbread, then you have the golden lampstand, and then the Ark of the Covenant is here as well. So again, uh, one more picture of these. Just was glad to pull them out and to you know just let you see different pictures of what this looked like. Now uh, again, the outer court. There are three items in the outer court that we will discuss. One, the gate. Two, the brazen altar. And three, the brazen laver. Now, remember, when we go back over here, this is the area where the work of the evangelist is being done. The evangelist is bringing people to the gate of Jesus. And the evangelist has a strong skill set to show them the altar and that sacrifice that's on that altar and even bring people into water baptisms. You will see the evangelist and the pastor working these areas. This is the work of the evangelist and the pastor. There's a lot of significance in this particular area that is required. It is required. This is a pattern that the church may have lost. And we have to iron out that wrinkle and make sure we come back into the place of understanding repentance is in this area right here. Repentance is here and that's key. And so this is important to understand because it teaches us about the Lord Jesus Christ himself because each article of furniture represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that tonight. And so coming back again, those three items, the gate, the brazen altar, the brazen laver, first passage of scripture that we're going to get to is the gate is what we're gonna talk about just for a couple of seconds. In John 12, 32, he says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself, which exactly, this is going to tell us exactly how the gate functions, actually, because it is lifted up, it is rolled up instead of a gate opening like a gate in our backyards. And then the second thing that we need to understand is, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is where we are charged at, to bring people to the gate. All of us are responsible for bringing people to the gate. Can you hear what I'm saying? That is critical. And so what we do is we come over here and you'll see a literal picture of that. Can y'all see that? Right here, you have that gate. You have a person bringing a sacrifice to the priest, and you see that the gate is rolled up. The gate is rolled up over here. And then the first thing that this man who has an, a sacrifice, the first thing he's going to see is a priest at the sacrificial altar. That's the first thing. He can't see anything else from that stance point. So this is the work of the evangelist to bring them to Christ, drawing them in, and then bringing them to an understanding of this sacrifice that has been made for their sins in the form of this animal right here is going to be brought in. And it's amazing when you remember in the book of Exodus where you know, the Passover uh, was about to be taken and God gave instructions and they literally had to have a relationship with that particular lamb that they chose without spot or wrinkle. You remember that? Without spot or blemish. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was they literally, the lamb became their pet. And I, I forget, I think it was for a week or so that they really took care of this pet. They made the, they became familiar. They became acquainted. They actually fell in love with this particular pet. And then 
before the Passover took place, uh, they had to literally take that same pit or that lamb and slit his throat. You know, can you imagine that? And take the blood and use the blood to sprinkle over the doorpost of their homes. So here's some scripture dealing with this particular thing. And that's, I'm going to be pretty much done with just laying this little foundation. Jesus is the gate to the tabernacle of life. By entering into him, we enter the gate of life. So Jesus said again, I am telling you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. That's John 10 and 7. Then you'll see, I am the gate. Those who come in by me will be saved. Look at that. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. That's John 10, 9 and 10. Then he says, go in, go in through the narrow gate. You remember that? Because the gate to hell is wide and the road that leads to it is easy. And there are many who travel it, but the gate to life is narrow and the way that leads to it is hard. And there are few people who find it, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Can y'all see that? That, so that the gate is the only way into the courtyard of the tabernacle, signifying that Jesus is the only way to the promise. Isn't that good? So Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. Y'all see that? John 10 and 1. And then finally, Jesus answered him, I am the way, here it is, the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. And then of course, add this to that, uh, that I, I went backwards here to, in, in I, if I am lifted up, that's John 12, 32, from the earth will draw all men to myself. Those are the key scriptures. Those are the key scriptures to the gate, okay? And so we, again, must be doing the work of the evangelist. That's our job. We need to draw men, bring men. We lift up the name of Jesus, meaning our skill set of who he is needs to be lifted up in 2022. We need to come to a place to where we know how to talk about Jesus because at the mention of his name, yeah, demons tremble, but there's power in his name. And the deaf here, the deaf in the spirit, y'all hear what I'm saying? The cripple in the spirit, the lame, the blind, they can hear there's something that God has put in every vessel, every vessel that at the mention of his name, there is a response. There is a response, amen? And some to anger and some to fear, amen? And so it is critical that we know how to bring people, all of us tonight, the charge here is let's get people to the door and then we're going to point them to the sacrifice. It's not please come to church, it's let me lift up Jesus in front of you. Let me tell you who he is. Let me tell you how wonderful and how powerful this Christ is, who is the promised child of God, who is God himself, who is the one who knows the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's our all in all. He's our everything. He will solve your problems. He'll give you life and life more abundantly abundantly if you come to Jesus. Your life will, I guarantee you, if you come to Jesus, your life will change. 
we have to have a very powerful, uplifting, living, edifying message that should come off of our lips concerning Jesus. We have to repent in the way that we've been speaking of him. I don't think that we've done enough. I don't think that we've been clear enough. I don't think we've been excited enough to talk about this Jesus that we know. So may there be a resurrection that comes as a result of a, of a repentance in us to be able to lift this Jesus Christ up, to tell people about how wonderful our savior is, to describe this sacrifice that was laid down for his friends to be able to accurately talk about uh, that particular event, even the crucifixion in his passion, to go into the depths to teach Christ, ladies and gentlemen, as the sacrifice that, that was acceptable to God, that was acceptable to turn away his wrath from men. And so the conversation that gets us to that particular place, because a lot of people, if you ask them, are you saved? They want to know, saved from what? We know the answer is you're saved from the wrath of God, not the devil, not even hell, the wrath of God, which puts you in hell, right? But here is the ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have a lot of people that will say, there is no heaven, there is no hell, and there's a whole lot of stuff, but you still have to do what? One man plants, another one waters, God brings the increase. We throw the seed, the soul went out to sow. Some seed fell on hard hearts. Some seeds fell on hearts with mixtures and with hard ground and shallowness. Some fell with the mixtures of the thorns and all in thistles and things that hindered the growth of the word. But sometimes you're gonna throw that seed and it's going to fall on good ground. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be slinging seed. We need to be slinging. We need to be about the father's business. And the Father's business is to preach the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to those that are lost. We must preach the Savior accurately, not Lord, not Lord, but Savior. We need to preach Savior. We, we need to bring people to a point to where they understand. Because let me tell you all something right now. People are sinking in this life. People are struggling in this life. People are full of despair and hopelessness in this life. So we have the message for now. And if we preach it with passion, if we preach it with power, with love and faith, you're going to see people's hearts turn to this Jesus because we're telling them that, they, and that's what the great evangelist Billy Graham was wonderful in doing. He was able to speak about your failing life here on this earth, your miserable life here on this earth, your empty life, your life without meaning and without purpose. But I've come to tell you something Billy would say. I've come to preach to you the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, who could turn everything around and bring light and life to your life, that could bring hope to you, to remove the despair and the pain and all that stuff. And that man would preach an incredible message. He was a skillful evangelist. Very, very skillful. And what was needed after that? You needed to have a team awaiting, the church awaiting to make what? Disciples of those that the evangelists brought a holy conviction into their hearts with hope of a savior. Now a person who now comes with that kind of expectation, the person that we hand them over to has got to have the same heart and the same message and the same hope, the same excitement has got to be passed on to the workers in the ministry that's the pastoral team. 
And the pastoral team has the skill set to help them see this savior, keep on seeing him that the evangelist brought. And what did the evangelist bring? He also brought what? Miracle signs and wonders. So he had a miracle crusade and people would come in to some of these people's uh, meetings like R.W. Schambach and A.A. Allen and T.L. Osborne. These guys had miracle signs and wonders that would blow your mind. Incredible altar calls of literal thousands and thousands of people. Now we need to make sure that we have a discipleship system that, listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, that works with the Holy Ghost. Not some man-made system, but works with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost met these people at the altar through an evangelist or someone doing the work of the evangelist, brought them there by the power of the Spirit. Now we have to keep on relying on the power of the Spirit and not kill them with man's traditions of joining a church and becoming a member of the church of our denomination or whatever that mess would be. But we have to keep Jesus alive and on fire in their heart and bring them into a true understanding in relationship with Christ by us having a relationship with them, loving on them and preaching through what? The discernment of the Holy Spirit as to what they need. If we listen to them, we have the answer to whatever they're complaining about. Whatever their issues are, whatever their woes are, the Holy Spirit is able to minister to that, to deliver them from their sickness, that disease, that problem, that fear, that alcoholism or whatever ism they have. Holy Ghost will meet them at that altar call, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, if it's in true power. And now that's what's holding them because they experience the miracle working power of the Holy Ghost through a man of God that has been prepared and equipped and then they're inside now accepting Jesus. Hey, hey, now they're saved. They recognize, listen, this Savior has delivered me from this miserable life that I'm living. And a lot of people, I'm telling y'all, God has been working on them to bring them to that decision that I need a savior. So when they come to a meeting, when they pop up into our churches visiting y'all, this is an individual potentially who has been, uh, the Holy Spirit has been dealing with them for years. They don't need to come and run into religion. They need to know this savior. They need people who are on fire that know the Lord that have a strong anointing and skill set, which is the anointing, to be able to deliver the, an accurate message of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. Keeping them hoping, a hope that does not disappoint. Teaching them about his love, a love that never lets down, a love that's not carnal off of this world but an agape, teaching them, plugging them into that. And here comes repentance. Here comes appetite, all those things. And it was amazing, the man that the story was about that we watched the other night. It, what was the name of the movie? Unbroken, the path of redemption. Yeah, unbroken, the path to redemption. If y'all want to write that down, that if you just tell that to your TV, uh, unbroken, the path to redemption is a good movie. Okay, and you'll see the work of the evangelist later on after all the misery in this man's life. It is a wonderful, wonderful uh, movie concerning how the role of the evangelist, Billy Graham, uh, played into that life. It was just refreshing to see, to see that. So that out of court experience, next we're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the burnt uh, sacrifice altar of bronze. And we'll look at that thing and talk about it. But remember right now, just this little short lesson and these few verses of scripture accurately depict what the door is. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the way. 
Jesus is the gate. He is the good shepherd. And if we can bring people to that place, may the Lord, by even prayer tonight, bring, give us the skill set to bring people to the gate where they might find life. Where they might find, and we need to be able to now start to minister. And yes, let's get the disciples in. We're ready to start to teach them on a certain level, but never forget this. Somebody please hear me. You are working with the Holy Ghost, not the Holy Ghost working with you. Please hear me on that. That's a difference, y'all know that, right? There's only one real way. See, you're being led by the Spirit. And when you're operating in the gifts of the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit is talking to you about this person. The Holy Spirit is showing you and giving you the words to say, to minister to them and to help. So you should be what? Have the component of prayer and intercession for your disciples. And the Holy Spirit will reveal their hearts and their lives to you. They'll be saying, how did you know that? Because it's a supernatural thing. You don't have to go call yourself a prophet. You don't have to even boast about any of that. But that's what's happening when you're working with the Holy Spirit. He will reveal the hearts of men to us if we're sensitive and if we're operating in faith working by love. Love working by faith. If that's operating, Holy Ghost will be there to, to speak and to give solutions and keep that person alive in Christ is what I want to say to everybody this evening. Amen. Can y'all understand the gate? Understand the door? Let us accurately preach and teach that. Now, listen, if we're going to get ready to go to the brazen altar, don't get the brazen altar mixed up with yourself in Romans 12 and 1. That's not what it is in this layer. This is the layer of salvation we're talking about, not you who is saved. You're not the one that's on that altar in this teaching. You're not presenting yourself as a sacrifice. No, Jesus is the sacrifice in what we're teaching right now. He's the sacrifice. He's the one. He's the savior for the brazen labor. Now, there's another dimension of the lesson as to when it gets personal. Now, who am I? How does this reference to me? And you can use Romans 12 and 1 and 2 as a reference to that as presenting your body as a living sacrifice. We may get into that. But right now, we're teaching the individual who starts at the gate and lead them all the way into the holy of holies. That's what this walk is gonna be. So we're gonna to try to stay there without getting too revelatory or shifting layers on you. We're gonna to try to just stay with what should be the accurate doctrine and the results we should be getting, what we should be expecting if we stay on track using the tabernacle. And trust me, this thing is accurate and it can get really deep. And it could get really profound. But if we, we stay on the surface, it is enough for us to build a solid foundation in a person's life. Can y'all hear what I'm saying? And what's got to happen is they don't backslide because we keep on moving. We keep on monitoring their lives and know when it's time for them to go to the next stage. Sometimes we might keep people in some churches, please hear what I'm saying, some ministries they only had a revelation because of a lack of fivefold ministry understanding. If you only have a evangelist, let's say you just got an evangelist that started a church. All they could do is talk about the gate, the altar, and water baptism. That's it. They don't know anything else. They don't know how, they don't have the grace to go any further, if y'all could hear what I'm saying. So what do they do? They keep preaching the cross, the cross, the cross. Even when people are in the church saved for 20 years, they got another message about the cross. No people visiting this way. Everybody in the church has been saved for 20 years. They'll preach the cross, the cross, the cross. 
because that's all they know. And that's a result of them not being part of a team, that a mature team that operates in different functions and levels of revelation. Y'all see what I'm saying? So it is important that we have all five because the pastor, the pastor is going to keep those people in certain areas and no matter what they do, he's going to make them good sheep. And they'll stay good sheep, nice and groomed, healthy, but they'll never ever step into a place of identity as sons. They'll be sheep instead of sons. And they, they won't be sons. They, if, they, if they're going to come to be sons, then they would be ministers serving God. They end up staying serving the church. You see what I'm saying? And so as a result of that, there's a lot of problems there. And there's no real growth there because they're still looking for God to do something for them. They're asking for stuff that they already have. And that's what wrong teaching will do. It'll, it'll cause the people to ask and beg for stuff they already have. Amen. So, so we want to make sure that we teach this with balance. And again, this is the area. All of us can work there. All fivefold ministry can do the work of the evangelist. All of us should have a skill set and a knowledge of how to work in the outer court. But some of us, there's just dimensions that we're called to. Y'all follow what I'm saying? You won't see an evangelist literally teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit at his revival where he does his best work or her best work. They won't do that. They're always teaching what? Salvation. They're ready for that big altar call where people are going to come in. That is where they dwell and they love it. That's like a plumber working on plumbing. He does not, he's not interested in being an electrician or a, a cement layer. That's not his job. His job is what? I'm coming to do the plumbing. Here's my time to do that. And that is okay. Now, does he know about the whole tabernacle? He probably should, but that's not his metron. That's not his measure to teach the Holy of Holies. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Although he has walked in the sanctuary because that's where he comes from. He is a minister. He is a priest. He should know his life should have started. He has gone through the tabernacle. Every leader should have gone from the door to the Holy of Holies. Every leader. Other than that, what you talking about? Y'all follow what I'm saying? Don't make you know, y'all see, y'all got me turning this thing into a leadership thing. But I got to tell you something. The leader should know and should be living in the Holy of Holies. We haven't been taught that. We have not been, please hear me, we have not been taught that we're just coming into ascension life now. You know, how does ascension life look and what is the ultimate desire of God? And that is that we become one with him, that we fellowship with him and operate from our seated places in the heavenlies, right? It, listen, Every minister has got to be able to know that they're coming from a heavenly place where they're seated. They minister from that. We have not been taught that. And so literally an ordination is affirming and confirming that that person is now in that place and they have the, the permission now uh, by elders and overseers in their lives that they can now operate in ministry from that place. Y'all follow what I'm trying to say? So whatever your ministry, whatever your ministry is, it's operating, it's supposed to be operating from the heavens. You should know how to open heavens. You should know how to access heavens. We all right? You're kind of still right there now. You're kind of still. But I'm telling you, that's what it is. So that's the mystery of the great Elijah, who said, I am Elijah, who stands in the presence of the Lord. He was giving us a revelation, you know, a powerhouse revelation, you see? And that's the difference of what? Watch this, y'all, y'all, don't, don't, don't let me lose y'all on this one. But we are the ascension gifts of Christ. <laughs> Can I say that to y'all one more time? We are the ascension gifts of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
he ascended on high and then gave gifts to men. So that's what makes us different. I don't want to taint this lesson. Maybe I don't stop right here, but that's where we are. And so we have to understand that mystery that we minister out of our position. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And you need to know your position. And that position is endorsed by God and men affirm, elders affirm what God is doing. That's why it's a dangerous thing and a ludicrous thing for a person to have called themselves and they're not part of the system that God has given to us. That's nonsense to me. You know, follow what I'm saying? Because when you look at the pattern, right? Because the pattern, what do you mean the pattern? What do you, man, when we're going to get to Aaron and his sons, when we're going to get to the priesthood, you'll see what I'm saying. You'll see what I'm saying. Amen. So this is all good stuff. Please pray for me because I want, I know the Lord's going to pull me out and end with this, but we'll try to stay with it until we have at least gotten to the, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron's rod that budded, the golden pot of manna, you know, when we get to all of that, and hopefully we can even get to the priest and his garments in the office and the function of the priest so that there could be some understanding there. We'll try to have a nice flow of conversation in that, amen? So uh, that's what we have for you tonight. Uh, the Lord bless you.